So welcome to our 2023 environmental policy lecture. My name is Curtis Rollins. So I'm here because I'm the president of ARIES WA, which is the Australasian Agricultural and Resource Economic Society WA branch. I'm also a PhD student at the University of Western Australia, and I'll be facilitating this event. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are in on here in Perth, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, before we are going. So this lecture is an initiative of the WA branch of ARIES and the UWA Center for Environmental Economics and Policy. And it started because uh, we wanted to expand our events to engage with people outside of the corridor that the majority of us work in uh, <laughs> at the UWA here. So each year we invite a leading international speaker to discuss important environmental and natural resource issues. And this gives us an opportunity to provide an interesting lecture to our membership base in WA, as well as across Australia. And I see that other people tend to join most years as well. So I, I'm noticing already we got people from across Australia and a few other countries. And I thank you all for being here this morning. So this year's lecture is gonna be on environmental and resource economics and systemic racism delivered by Professor Amy Ando. So Amy's just about to start a new position as chair of the excellent department at Ohio State University, the Department of Ag, Environment and Development Economics there. She received her PhD from MIT, proceeded to work at Resources for the Future, where she still serves as a university fellow, and then worked as a professor at the University of Illinois and continues to work as a professor at the University of Illinois for another couple of days. <laughs> So Amy's had an impressive career to date, and I'm assuming that's going to keep on continuing. So she's published in many impressive journals, including Science, PNAS, Jerry, GEEM. She's currently temporarily the editor of the American Journal of Agricultural Economics, about to hand that over. And she's received grants from a lot of different uh, large American foundations like the National Science Foundation and the US EPA. And to cap it all off, Amy was just recently named a fellow of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists. So when we were looking at topics for this year's lecture, um, I came across this paper on the environmental economics blog. I read it. I thought it was great. And when we were thinking of different ideas for this lecture. This was the first thing that popped into my head. We were at our meeting and I said, there's no way we could make this happen. It's a 12 hour time difference. We thought we'd email Amy anyhow. And Amy's currently just gone through a move to a new city, a new job. It's 8 p.m. and she still agreed to do this. So I'm very thankful for this. Uh, thanks again, Amy. I'll thank you so much again at the end. Uh, so following the talk, just for a bit of housekeeping, we will have a question period. So throughout the lecture, feel free to throw questions in the Q&A tab and you can give the questions you really like a thumbs up and that will make me more likely to see them. And then I'll make sure uh, we can get to those ones. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Amy. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Curtis. And thank you for the invitation to do this. Um, uh, let me see. Let me share this properly. All right. Can you see that? Yeah, looks good. Yep. Okay, great. Um, this is the first time I've presented this paper. This this paper is currently a working paper with resources for the future, but it's been accepted for publication in the Review of Environmental Economics and Policy and will be forthcoming there. Um, I have to give a huge shout out to my to the, the not my uh, to 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 the co-authors of of this paper. It is absolutely one of the most team efforts of any team efforts I've ever done. Um, I almost feel bad uh, giving a talk on this all by myself because it was so completely created as a joint effort. And it was created as a joint effort because we came together, all of us, um, uh, at a time in the United States of really serious uh, racial reckoning um, to think about what could our profession do better. And we have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this and talking about this. This paper is one product of that work. Um, and, and I think uh, at least a subset of the people are, are going to be doing more work in this as well. Um, so this is not going to be a regular research seminar. It was actually really hard to think about how to do it because, you know, we all know how to give a talk about empirical work and we know how to give a talk about theory. This is not that. It's a team effort. 
Um, it's not empirical research. It's not formal theory. It is a think piece, um, not a piece of work of environmental economics, but a, but a, a piece thinking about how we do what we do. And um, in my slides, you will see me occasionally using this acronym e ENREs. Um, environmental and natural resource economists. We we are environmental and natural resource economists, and that is our audience in in this paper. Although I actually think that some of the work is relevant to to agricultural and food economics as well. But, um, one thing I'll say as b before I get too too far into the talk is that this paper. Um, synthesizes and builds upon a large body of previous research. Um, in my slides, I'm not going to cite all the papers or it just be one great big mess of citations. Um, but the citations are all in the paper. Uh, I think I have a, a link to that in these. And it's pretty easy to find if you just Google RFF, Amy Endo, it will, Sarah Jacobson, you'll find it. Um, a lot of great papers in there, and we were pretty mindful to make sure that we were citing a, a broad range of people, so a broad range of perspectives were being represented in the work. So the context context for for this is that um, it you know environmental and natural resource economists are themselves disproportionately white and Asian. Um, some recent research, sort of studying the state of the profession said that, you know, 62% and 31% of us, respectively, are those races and only 2% Black. And we are disproportionately wealthy, even compared to other academics in other fields. Um, that makes it a little bit hard for us to, uh, unless we really are deliberate in thinking about concerns of marginalized people, um, it's not you know, those concerns are not just going to pop into our heads because we aren't living those lives. Those are don't tend to be our personal communities. At the same time, um, there is, and this is good to see, there is multi-scale concern rising uh, around environmental justice. Certainly in the United States, um, there's concern about, you know, within a city or an area, um, disparities between uh, people in different groups who have different levels of environmental quality. And there's also at the global scale concerns about uh, climate justice and, and, you know, across country differences in access to good resources and clean environments. Um, in the U.S. as well, <laughs> uh, it's so interesting, right? And now we're starting to see the pushback. But there has been this growing awareness of, uh, of systemic racism in our country and the ways in which that intersects with environmental justice. Um, so there's really a growing burgeoning amount of research about the racial gaps in income, in wealth, in health, education, criminal justice, housing, everything. Um, and understanding that these aren't just accidents, that, that there are historical and current structures in place not just the actions of a few individuals, but but the structures of systems that put those gaps in place and that contribute to patterns of environmental injustice as well. Um, I, I'm really interested to, to be speaking with you all. Uh, I, I gave a talk in a, a different country uh, last year about one of my papers about environmental justice. And it was so interesting because because the the researchers there were like, well, why are you talking about race? Why is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, the United States has its own particular issues with race, and I know that that the 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 boundaries of who is favored and who is marginalized are are different in every country. And so I'm sort of interested in what this looks like and what the conversations are like in Australia. But um, you know, who's marginalized varies, but there there does tend to be haves and have nots uh, and histories around those structures in other countries. And there certainly is cross-country concern about equity. So all of that's going on. Um, so today I'm going to present an overview of the thoughts in this paper, the, you know, the, the product of our months of conversations. Um, that will include a brief description of what we think of as some common features of our discipline, environmental and natural resource economics, that can inadvertently serve to propagate inequities. 
Um, and then some specific examples of three kinds of work in the profession that could be improved upon to try to make sure that the way that we are doing our work isn't um, maintaining or even exacerbating uh, disparities in access to environmental quality. And so those are non-market valuation and aggregation for cost-benefit analysis, um, policy modeling and analysis, and prescriptions for managing the comments. I do, please do ask me questions. Um, I'm not going to pretend, you know, in this paper, we are not saying these are the problems, these are solutions that you all get on board. <laughs> um, we wrote this to open a dialogue, to open a whole set of conversations in our profession. And so um, I'm going to try to leave. I, I was encouraged to write the talk to be 30 or 45 minutes. I'm going to try to leave a lot of time for discussion with all of you to the extent to which we can do that. Um, via Teams, um, and there's there's the link to the paper in case you are looking for it. Okay, so what are what are these features that 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 we we thought of that that seem to help to maintain inequities? The first one, and this is pretty obvious, uh, is is the fact that historically. Um, economists have focused on economic efficiency. Um, you know, it was not that long ago that you'd go to a conference and somebody would give a talk and somebody would say, oh, but, you know, we're economists. We we study efficiency and cost effectiveness. We don't, we, you know, equity, that's that's somebody else's job. Um, if efficiency seems politically neutral, right? We're we're not we're not worrying about distribution efficiency. That that's a thing. However, um, the implicit claim in saying all we want is efficiency, that all Pareto efficient outcomes are fine, is a super strong value judgment. Um, I I teach. Oh goodness, my cats are going to come visit. Of course they are. Uh, uh, I teach a, a class on the economics of food and environmental justice, and and um, and I ask my students to reflect upon the fact that a Pareto efficient outcome is that I have everything and you have nothing. <laughs> uh, couldn't make me you better off without making me better worse off, but but is that is that really? Um, do we as a society think that that is just as good as any other Pareto efficient outcome? Maybe not. Um, this focus, uh, traditional focus on economic efficiency also just kind of limits the research questions that people ask. Um, and so uh, there are lots of research questions to be asked about uh, distribution and structures that lead to inequities. But if we think our job is just to study efficiency, then we won't we won't do that research. A second more more subtle uh, issue is that. Um, as a profession, we don't pay a lot of attention to procedural justice. So uh, in the environmental justice literature, uh, people talk about um, dist distributional justice, which is just, you know, who gets what? It's a focus on outcomes. And to the extent to which a lot of economists now are thinking about uh, equity issues, um, it's almost always about distributional justice. But procedural justice, which which means, you know, is there fair involvement of all groups of people in discussions and decision making is also really important. And if you talk to people in, in other social science disciplines, um, they will they will talk a lot about how important this is. It's important just for its own sake um, that, you know, lots of humans place serious value on procedural justice. Um, you know, even if the outcomes aren't great, at least you were there and you were heard and you had a seat at that table. Um, procedural justice is also important because without it, it can be hard to gain knowledge from the marginalized people who aren't parts of those conversations. So if you have procedural justice, it might be easier to have distributional justice. And then I, I think the third the third issue that kept coming up as as we were working on this paper is that um, economists uh, 
often, not always, but often overlook detail, really important details of historical and institutional contexts of a, of a, of a problem. So um, there are a lot of frictions and barriers for marginalized people that that are that have really important effects. Um, but you know, when we do theory, you need to simplify the model, right? <laughs> you can't include all the details. And, um, and so especially in theory, uh, we, you know, we, as we simplify and pare things down, um, we assume away transaction costs. We, we, we tend to assume away a lot of these things that are actually extremely important for the actions that people are able to take. Um, and and I'll, I'll be talking about this about this later. Um, the the ways in which it, it can have really big effects on on the the accuracy of of our research. Another issue with you know being ahistorical um, and you know just not paying attention to the in institutional context is that we we tend to take initial endowments as given. Um, I, I'm imagining my first I, in the process of moving, I found all my graduate school notebooks, right? And all, all that, all that theory. And so you have initial endowments, right? Um, of, of wealth and income and maybe resources. And, and then from there, markets are great. Um, but in the real world, there are often huge inequities in the initial endowments that today's people have wealth, health, power, and those often stem from historic discrimination. It's not just random accidents. Uh, there's a reason in the United States that black Americans have much, much, much less wealth than white Americans. Um, you know, they were, they were dispossessed and actively prevented from accumulating wealth. Um, so it's a little bit of a challenge, a problem to just say, okay, these are the initial endowments. We're going to take that as given and move on because doing that essentially accepts, um, sorry, the associated inequity as reasonable. Um, we're, we're, we're baking in that historic discrimination into the things that flow from our policies moving forward. Um, and so, you know, coming to grips with the history behind these initial endowments and thinking about whether that is, in fact, OK, um, uh, is is a useful thing if you really want to be thinking about environmental justice. And then finally, um, one feature of environmental economics is that we we study a fairly narrow set of policies. Um, so most of the time we'll study environmental regulations like command and control or incentive policies, cap and trade, pollution taxes. There are other more sweeping policies that could totally disrupt the inequitable status quo um, and improve environment for vulnerable people. And we don't tend to study those. And I will talk explicitly more about that later. Um, but just in general, thinking about non-marginal changes um, might in fact be necessary if you want if you're interested in doing research that has the potential to make serious progress on doing something about environmental injustice. Okay, so all of these all of these um, things th these were just sort of features of the profession. What I'm going to do next is to start talking is to talk about some specific kinds of research that we do. And the ways in which um, the way we tend to work might uh, might have problems. So I do a lot of research on non-market valuation, and so I'll start with that since that's one of the the things here that that I had a comparative advantage in in our team. Uh, so uh, there's a huge literature on non-market valuation, tons of papers estimating willingness to pay and willingness to accept for environmental goods. Um, both of those we know will be higher for people who have more income, also probably more wealth, although actually, as we were talking about this, I don't think there's there's a lot of research about that, and that, that's actually a bit of a gap. Um, 
So the fact that at least in the United States, there's a correlation, a strong correlation between race and income um, can make it seem like minoritized people have lo- have lower, less intense preferences for things. You know, willingness to pay is explicitly a budget constrained value measure. You know, willingness to accept, um, even though it's not explicitly va- uh, budget constrained, um, if people have yeah, if you have less money, that can still be lower. Um, so if we if we are the fact that this is our our the way that we estimate preferences, um, just automatically, if you had two people and they had the same preferences, um, and one is black and has less income than a person who is white, it will seem like those minoritized people have less intense preferences for things. Um, it's not a bias in willingness to pay, but but if but our measure willingness to pay as an as a sense of preferences um, really conf- you know income ha- plays such an important role in that that it's problematic when you have this history of race and income. Another more subtle point is that um, racism, both historic and current, can actually distort people's current preferences. Um, So one thing that's fairly easy to understand is that, uh, and this is definitely true in the United States, minoritized people might be genuinely and, you know, with good reason, be afraid to do outdoor recreation, right? And perhaps you've seen on the news the the guy who went bird watching in Central Park and was harassed by a white woman who called the police on him. Um, our nation's history is one of extraordinary racial violence, and people in some racial groups have stories and and a history and even current concerns that it just might not be such a safe thing to go out hunting in places where other people are hunting. Um, so does that mean that in the absence of that racism, uh, minoritized people might not enjoy outdoor things, right? So if if we didn't live in that world, perhaps that would be a good thing. And so perhaps there are things we can do. Um, but it, but it's at least worth acknowledging the role that racism might play if you find in your research that uh, people in minoritized groups have lower willingness to pay for outdoor recreation. Uh, there's also some research uh, that we, we cite in the paper showing that uh, racism can work the other way and people in dominant groups might uh, uh, actively avoid recreating in areas that have a lot of minoritized people uh, because they are not comfortable being around people who are not in their own racial group. Um, you know, if we lived in a different world and people understood each other better, uh, then, you know, it might be a perfectly nice speech or a perfectly nice lake. And um, so, you know, is is the research wrong? Well, maybe it's, it is capturing current preferences, um, but do we want to make policy decisions on the basis of preferences that emerge from a climate of racism? I don't know. It's complicated um, and something to be thought about on a case-by-case basis. Um Earlier, I, I mentioned uh, the importance of not overlooking frictions. Um, this is this is one example of that. So, uh, some of our methods can yield actual biased measurements um, because we are overlooking real world frictions. So, uh, an easy example is travel cost valuation. So, with travel cost valuation, you you know, person lives here and it takes them. You know the the cost of getting from here to the beach is it's you know two mu- two hours away by car. We estimate the cost of getting there by car, and essentially that's each person's cost of getting there, and we use that and their trip frequency to estimate um, their willingness to pay the value that they get from traveling to that place. One issue again in the United States, uh, people of color are less likely to own a car. Um, 
we're a very car dominated country. Um, but, but a lot of people don't have cars. And, and in that case, your, your actual cost of travel is higher than you would estimate if you just assumed they had a car and went on your merry way. And, and so in that case, a travel cost study would underestimate the willingness to pay of people who don't have cars for the good in question. So we are actually getting a biased estimate. Um, another example is the hedonic housing price method, where um, you know we we assume people can buy whatever uh, house they want, um, and they choose the house that's the best combination of features and cost for them. Uh, but there's a lot of research showing that there are are still not just historic barriers, but there are still current barriers discouraging minoritized people from uh, choosing to buy homes in nice areas. Um, and so uh, that calls into question the results of a hedonic housing price analysis because people aren't actually free to sort as as they would like to. I, I don't think, I don't know what else to do, right? So as I say, we're in this paper, we're raising more questions than we are answering. But I, but this is such a, a, a well-documented problem that I think that those of us who do this kind of research need to think about uh, ways in which we might want to change the way we do this kind of work. And then uh, the last... I think this is the last thing for welfare economics, willingness to pay versus willingness to accept. Um, in the United States, former guidance for policy analysis is to use willingness to pay as the value estimate. It's more conservative. Um, however, willingness to accept is the conceptually appropriate measure, right? If you have a thing, how much would we have to pay you to make you whole if it is taken away? Um, that's what we should be using under those circumstances. And so using willingness to pay instead makes our estimated value of the loss really too low. Um, this is relevant fairly often to native native peoples. Um, so in the United States, there was a couple of years ago, this case of the Standing Rock tribe um, that, that was objecting ferociously to the the routing of the Dakota Access uh, oil pipeline through their sacred lands, and they lost that battle. Um, and you know their willingness to accept was essentially infinite. <laughs> um, but that's not a value that would be used in this conversation in our formal government processes. Um, I won't talk a lot about this, but all the, you know, the, the problems that we have with individual values become particularly important when we aggregate for policy analysis. So the aggregated values um, that minoritized people have are going to have that same downward bias. And, and that can affect where governments are willing to make improvements. So if you have a community that is disproportionately uh, uh, minority people live there and, and they have low income. If you were to say, where are we gonna get the largest value? Well, it's gonna be in a rich white community rather than a low income minority community. Um, so I think we have to be a little bit careful when if we just blithely estimate willingness to pay, add it up, make some choices, um, the extent to which that historic, you know, the, the gaps in income and wealth are based on historic systemic racism. Um, if we if we if we allow that to shape our forward looking investments, um, that's potentially problematic. Um, so in general, low income people have their preferences weighted less in cost benefit analysis and and that tends to be the people most affected by pollution. They're the people who are often poor and have their different preferences underweighted. Um, US EPA is in actually the uh, Office of Management and Budget in the United States are working on changes to the guidelines for uh, cost benefit analysis. Um, I haven't had a chance to see what the new things are, but it sounds like they're gonna try to pay a little bit, bit more attention to equity. And so I'm excited to see what, what emerges from that. 
Oh, there's one more thing on this topic. So this is something I really don't know what we can do about it. But just in thinking, it's just worth mentioning. Um, our whole approach to welfare economics reflects um, sort of a colonial philosophies. I, I don't think that phrase appear, appeared in the paper, but as I was working on my on my talk, I thought I would throw it in there. Um, economics tends to use anthropocentrism, so focus on human well-being, uh, commensurability, so everything's fungible. Um, I can trade you your standing rock native sacred lands for a lot of cars. I don't know. And consequentialism, so outcomes matter more than process. Um, these ideas and philosophies really pervade our official approaches to the environment and, and certainly are prominent in our profession. But those approaches are really profoundly at odds with the value systems of many marginalized and especially indigenous cultures. Um, we don't, I, I don't think we really know what to do about that, but I think there's a lot, maybe, you know, first step might be just to to learn more about other cultures and to think about what, what economics might look like if we took different foundations as a starting point. It might be really interesting. Okay, well, this is a policy talk, so let's talk about policy analysis. Um, one of the big issues that we have with policy analysis is this neglecting of equity relevant complexities. Models demand abstraction. Um, and if we abstract from equity relevant things, we're going to get recommendations that are wrong and bad for disadvantaged people. Um, so I guess I, I, I talked about this already, this first thing about hedonic and public finance models. Um, but I guess before I was talking about it in the context of valuation, that's also true in models of, you know, what's going to happen if you, um, if you clean up an area to TBU sorting models, right? Uh, if we assume everyone's going to sort freely to live in the best places, if there are these barriers, then, um, then people who are discriminated against are not going to have the opportunity to live in those nice areas and are more likely to get crowded out of it. Um, and so the outcomes of who benefits from environmental investments are going to be different than predicted. Um, another quite different thing is that when we analyze environmental regulation, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the, um, cost effectiveness and efficiency of this command and control rule or, or an environmental tax, we tend to assume compliance. Uh, in fact, in, in US EPA uh, policy analysis guidelines, uh, the analysts are, are, are instructed to assume compliance. Well, there's research about compliance that shows that that's wrong. We know that not all polluters comply with environmental regulations. Um, we know that compliance is lower in, you know, marginalized communities. We know that enforcement is less stringent. Uh, there are fewer enforcement actions in low-income communities. And so assuming compliance means that our policy analysis assume is going to be wrong um, in ways that, that disproportionately harm marginalized people. You might say, oh, yes, this is going to be fine. You know, this will be good. Um, but with non-compliance, it's not good and and would not have been uh, a good enough policy. And then finally, um, to the extent to which we we still talk about COSI and bargaining as kind of a policy, uh, the transaction costs associated with COSI and bargaining are often much higher for marginalized people. Um, and so, you know, assuming that that everybody is going to be able to negotiate their way out of inefficient situations is, is going to be particularly untrue for, for folks who don't have a voice. I think about this. Uh, so an example um, that I talk about sometimes in my class is uh, farm workers who are exposed to pesticides. Many farm workers in the United States are, um, not citizens. Uh, some are not here fully legally, and um, both of those things put them at risk. And so, you know, if you get sprayed by a crop duster, um, 
you might not be in a position to demand changes and improvements in safety because uh, you might be afraid of being deported. Okay, so that's policy analysis. Um, next, I want to I do want to talk about managing the commons. Um, it's a little bit different. We have all learned about the tragedy of the commons. Um, and and I admit that it's going to be hard for me to change how I teach environmental economics. Uh, you know, this whole idea that open access resources, you're going to have people, you know, non-cooperatively overusing it, that is baked, <laughs> baked into our profession, highly influential. However, it is grounded in an in intellectual history of opposition to non-white migration to U.S. and the U and Europe, and to, and and a eugenic history. So Garrett Hardin, the guy who wrote the the tragedy of the Commons article, um, in the United States, the Southern Policy Law Center is a really excellent organization um, that fights uh, hate groups. Um, the bunch of lawyers out there trying to protect us all from the KKK. But Gary Hardin has a page on the Southern Policy Law Center um, because he himself was, was problematic. And so here's a quote for him. Uh, certain, certain racial groups have, quote, adopted overbreeding as a policy to secure their own aggrandizement. And because of this, he argued, the freedom to breed is intolerable. So some of the calls for population control uh, end up demonizing childbirth by women in color, women of color, um, which is very dangerous. It, it can lead to um, acts of violence against women of color um, and, and policies uh, to, to, to control uh, uh, population growth uh, in some parts of the world. I'm not saying that people today who, who call for concern about population growth are racist, but certainly the, the, the origins of that idea were. And, and I, I don't think most of us realize that. I did not realize that. I had a whole moment of sitting and thinking about that for, for a while. And so it's, it's important for us to be aware of that. Um, we end up perhaps overusing property rights solutions to open access resource management. Um, and, and my colleagues who wrote that part of the paper did a really great job of giving examples of cases in which, you know, oh, well, you just have to establish property rights and that does, does away with the open access resource problem. That often ends up dispossessing indigenous people, curtailing pretty functional traditional local rights. It often has problems with procedural justice, and um, and there are real world examples where you know if you have payments for ecosystem services, sorry services not systems, um, you create rents, right? And that can create incentives for resource seizure by powerful parties. Uh, apparently, there is a term carbon pirates. I did not know that was a thing. Um, so so we have to be careful. I'm not saying that that. None of that is ever a good idea. Uh, I think individual tradable quotas of fish have been really valuable for a lot of fisheries. But but I think it's maybe important to to be nuanced in our application of of these of this particular approach to thinking about common resources. Okay. So looking forward, um, we've just tossed a lot of things out there for people to think about. There is a lot of energy in our community of environmental and natural resource economists to do better work on environmental justice. So what do we do? Um, one thing that has come up repeatedly at symposiums and conferences, um, it, it's certainly helpful. A lot of research on environmental justice describes inequitable patterns in exposure to pollution, and that's fine. But maybe it's a good moment to to move past that and to think and to study why things are how they are, uh, because that might help us to understand what to do if we want to change those patterns. Um, we could adjust our valuation methods to avoid biases. We could build equity into, into procedures for cost-benefit analysis. We could put policy-relevant complexities into our theoretical models. 
adopt more nuanced approaches to thinking about management of the commons. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we could do that could be really interesting. Thinking outside the box, all of that is, you know, we do our research, let's do it a little bit differently. Um, sometimes people talk about doing more community engaged research. Um, I will say that that has to be done very carefully, very mindfully. And it's not like you can just go out tomorrow and say, all right, community, I am here to engage with you. <laughs> come, come help me with my research. Um, it's really important not to be exploitative uh, without meaning to be. So um, talk with other scholars who are already working on race, who know what some of those real world complexities are that we've been ignoring. Um, we could think proactively, this came up a lot in the discussion about uh, the management of the commons. Think about how our research is gonna be used and maybe head off problematic uses. Um, something else that we could do that isn't directly about research, but to the extent to which our community of researchers would be stronger if we had more diverse voices in it. We can do that if we improve our pipeline. Um, and to do that, we need to change how and what we teach. So centering concerns of marginalized people, maybe avoid teaching known problematic paradigms. I should have put big question marks here. De decolonize the curriculum. I've been thinking about this in my own te teaching. There I am, I'm a white lady rich white ladies standing up there talking about environmental justice. Um, perhaps I need to have uh, guest speakers um, who are from marginalized communities and let them share their truths rather than me telling my students what I think about them. So I don't know. Um, it, we wrote this paper to get everybody thinking and talking. And I have, in fact, left plenty of time to answer questions and to hear what your thoughts are. And so I certainly welcome any ideas that you might have. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Amy. That was a really great talk. Um, so just to give everyone the housekeeping on this, uh, it's set up as a webinar, so you're not able to automatically just turn on your video and microphone on your own. But if you put your hand up, if you type a question in the Q&A or put something in the chat, I will be able to allow you to ask any questions that you might have. And. I'm looking at Q&A, I can, I can provide my slides. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Great, I can circulate those. And. Good, just want to make sure I'm not, I've been cutting out a bit, but I think I'm in now. Uh, so I was going to ask you to start it off if you have any more advice on how you've approached teaching and curriculum. Because when I think about maybe how we directly reach the largest amount of people, it's through undergraduate teaching. Um, right. It's right. a surefire direct way. What, what has your experience been with kind of slowly revising your curriculum based on this new project? Yeah, well, so um, the first thing that I did was to actually create a class, I, I mentioned this, on the economics of food and environmental justice, and it's a large gen ed class and reaches a couple hundred students a semester, and that has been extremely gratifying. Um, we we have lots of good conversations, and um, and you know, I highly recommend that. But then, you know, thinking about the rest of the economics curriculum, I think, I don't know. So so that that group, uh, a subset of the of the co-authors of this paper are working on a paper about about the teaching, about what a revised curriculum for environmental economics would look like, you know, thinking about um, the problems that, you know, that would interest a broader set of students. Yeah, I don't know. Um, something. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it would also help engage a new generation of students who are maybe feeling a little skeptical of economics. I think we've all had those econ profs yes. who, when you bring up distribution and fairness, they say economists don't do that. That's not something the profession does. And I think it drives a lot of people away when they are a bit interested. So I think it's a good way it of does. attracting people who will make that change. So 
exactly. That's uh, the whole. Well, are you able to stop sharing your screen? Oh, gonna... sure. Perfect. I'm just seeing myself there. too many places. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I saw Dave had a question. Dave, do you want to uh, make this a little more interactive and join the video again, or if you're able to? Perfect. OK, okay. Um, so Amy, my, my question is about uh, cost benefit analysis um, and how these sorts of issues might be addressed there. I mean, the, the usual advice is to uh, to people who are doing a benefit cost analysis is to just quantify who wins and who loses, you know, to actually break down the distribution of benefits and costs yep. and report that to decision makers yep. and then leave it at that. Leave it, <clears throat> excuse me, leave it to the decision makers to sort of make what they will of that and apply their own equity judgments or whatever to that. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, I, I guess that's a start, but you know, what What would you, do you have any thoughts about where we go from there? I know some have advocated for weightings, but others have said, no, that's not a good idea. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it, it is a start, but, you know, unfortunately, I think that at the end of the day, that <laughs> that one number, whether it's a ratio or, or a, a, a net benefits, ends up carrying the day. And it's, I think it's pretty hard to say, well, this thing has a huge negative net benefit, but it's really good for this tiny group of marginalized people, so we should do it anyways. Uh, I don't know. I, I myself don't there, – there are there, there are weightings. Actually, there, there are even – it's interesting. I, uh, in, in Europe, I think it was much more common to use social welfare functions that – had equity weightings, um, you know. So earlier in my career, going to the conferences in Europe, it was much more. I felt like I was seeing a lot more papers that would use a social welfare function that had a preference for equity. Um, so, you know, but we, but I think then we have to have a conversation <laughs> about, about what is our preference for equity. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the U.S. is going to do. Um, you know, right now we're having this huge pushback against concerns about equity. Um, so I don't know what we're going to do, but at least uh, starting by showing the breakdown, it's a start. I I hope other people who are smarter than me can come up with some good solutions. So I see some comments in the chat. Yeah. Uh, Michael okay. said this seems to be a critique of more than environmental economics. But mm -hmm. of the basis of using market values as a basis, yeah, um, yes, as a basis for research management, that that certainly, um, I think you're right. I think that is part of it. Yeah, that's that's the impression I got when I read it too. Is that it's so much it's so much bigger than environmental economics. Um, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I will see Ram. I'll see if I'm able to let you ask your question. I'll allow you to turn your mic on. We'll see if. We'll see how the technology works. Um, you might be able to access it now. If not, we can just read your question out. Um, thanks, Gardis. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, I can. OK, thank you, Amy, for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, the way I was thinking when you uh, talked about the equity, and you rightly alluded that uh, the focus, the economist uh, has put a bit more focus on the distributional equity, not uh, on the procedural equity. Uh, mm -hmm. As a result, whatever the results uh, or whatever the outcome of the research is, uh, perhaps the effectiveness or the impact of those sort of research perhaps are not there as much as the researcher or the policymakers have thought about. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that context, uh, how do we... Uh, capture the procedural equity in the process. As you alluded, OK, bring more people on the table or uh, even then there might be an issue, a power issue. As a result, they might not come to the same table and talk mm -hmm. and in the same way. So mm -hmm. uh, what's your thought on bringing procedural justice in environmental economics or natural resource economics related research? Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you for that. And somebody in the chat also spoke about issues of equal power. Um, I think that's absolutely right. We didn't use the word power, but we should have. Um, so I believe that Danae Hernandez is is that there are some people doing research about procedural equity. Um, it's you know it it. it uh, I hope to see what what work she's doing. Um, social other social scientists uh, study this a lot, and and they will study, um, you know, who who spoke and who was present and so on and so forth. So there at least are ways to quantify whether there was procedural equity. Um, <clears throat> but it's 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 i don't know it would involve us learning new research methods um which is maybe not a bad thing uh and um and it could also be you know some of it is how should we change the way we do research but some of it is how do we approach the before and after right so we, we have a tendency we talk to these people we come up with our research questions we do our research we communicate it to the policymakers. end of story um, maybe promoting procedural justice is a question of engaging. And actually, the U.S. government is doing this. They're they're really requiring much more community engagement on the part of government agencies early on in things. And, but then also, you sort of engagement throughout. Um, so we do a research project instead of only just talking to the EPA. You know, go talk to the people who could be affected and get feedback from them. Um, that that is not something we really know how to do, but it could be really fascinating, right? So maybe maybe that's part of procedural justice too. Thank you. I see a question from. Nicola Thomas that is getting lots of thumbs up. So I've, I've allowed you to turn on your mic if you'd like to ask it, Nicola. Um. Hi, Amy. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's fantastic. I was just wondering, so there's um, becoming a lot more interest in environmental impacts in Australia and particularly on Indigenous communities. But mm -hmm. there's a range of cultural sites like the Orge Dakota Pipeline and you sort of said that the willingness to pay, willingness to accept may not be always effective. How? What are some other ways if you know that we could potentially use to value these cultural, culturally significant sites? I bet if we talked to Indigenous people, they would say you can't value them, that that just as a notion doesn't make sense. Um, and that that's the challenge, right? We 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 have we we have a hammer. We everything's a nail, <laughs> and 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 maybe sometimes we can we can change our hammer. Um, but it could be that you know why do we? Ah, so maybe we step back a little bit and we say why do we do valuation? Right? Why do, why do we do this? Um, we're not actually charging for air. Right? <laughs> we do valuation to provide information to help us make decisions about policies, about investments. So it could be that we decide that for some categories of things, that's not, we're not going to do cost benefit analysis. That's not an approach we're going to take. We're going to take a different approach entirely. I don't know what that is. Um, but I, I mean, certainly I think using willingness to accept is better than willingness to pay because it's not budget constrained. Um, but I think that what you end up with is it's infinite, and we don't even acknowledge that framework of thinking about our our sites. So it really puts us outside of our comfort zone. Yeah, thanks. I think I see Ben has a couple questions. Ben, would you like to ask your favorite of your two questions or somehow uh, make them hybrid? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm just um, I'm just thinking in some in some situations, then monetary valuation is viewed as offensive. And perhaps the pipeline example uh, is a is a case in point. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you have any 
this is an easy question. Have you, have you got any suggestions for how we make progress where where that is the case? And and the other the other I'm combining the questions now. I'm just in some situations, then discounting the future is also offensive mm -hmm. because uh, people say, well, you know, my children, I, I value my children almost more than I value myself. So how come we're discounting? So I just yeah. wonder about those those two issues in cost benefit analysis and yeah, how we make point. progress in that situation. Thank you. That's a good point. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I, I think they're a little bit different. The 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 first the the question of sites that are that are sacred to people that's really a question of you know are there some things that aren't fungible are there some things where we should just say all right this is not true of everything not all land is created equal but there are some things that are just off the table we are not going to do this so then the economic analysis, what is the cost minimizing way to put the pipeline so it doesn't go through the Standing Rock's sacred lands, <laughs> right? We have a different job. Um, uh, so so that, that's about that. The, the question of discounting is, is interesting. And I, I do think that the US EPA has new guidelines that call for at least using an extremely low discount rate for projects with long-term um, uh, effects, uh, intergenerational equity and other things. Um, you know, I, I think it's a little bit, short-term discounting makes a lot of sense and you can explain that to people. They're like, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, long-term discounting because of the intergenerational stuff is complicated. And, um, and I think, we're gradually coming up with some good faith uh, ways to balance the fact that, you know, we can do stuff with money now that could benefit the future, but we also need to not be discounting future generations. I think we're making progress on that. Yeah, and I think, so I see some comments and questions that could maybe be uh, combined here a bit and also really speak to what we've been, been talking about. So I see Elizabeth uh, said, do you, have you given serious thought to the fact that a monetary metric in itself is a problem? And then Steve also said in the chat uh, on a similar vein is, is no measure better than a bad measure or is it the opposite? So kind of thinking about it, is, is money a problematic yeah. metric? And if it is, is it still better than having no measure at all? This comes up, so most of my research has just been about uh, endangered species conservation, species and habitat conservation. And I've had a lot of conversations with biologists where the biologists say, we can't value nature, nature is priceless. Um, however, uh, I actually do think it's important um, because, because of the way our policies get made. If if some if we don't estimate the value of a thing, then it's basically zero. And so you know if somebody's looking for a place to build a dam, if you haven't estimated the 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 value of what's lost, well the dam's going to produce hydro hydropower, yay! <laughs> right, and then there's nothing on the other side, nothing quantifiable on the other side to counteract that. So. At least in this imperfect, well, in this world, I don't know, of course it's imperfect, but in this world that we live in and the way that our policy processes work, I think that bad numbers are better than none for some purposes, because uh, if you're going to do a cost-benefit analysis anyways, by God, you better have a number in there, or it's just zero. Hmm. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I'm aware of the time now. It is, it is 9 p.m. in uh, where no, Amy is. No, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, One last question? Should... Yeah, sure. Um, we have several to choose from. <laughs> uh, let's see. I will look at this. So, uh, yeah, I think that Diane's question actually was highlighted by quite a few other people. I will try to find Diane and allow her to turn her mic. Oh, I think she's had to leave. Uh, but there's been quite a bit of chat about 
you know, the opportunity for more transdisciplinary work. So Ross even mm-hmm. talked about maybe the idea of engaging more with law- yes. legal scholars, lawyers, politicians. Uh, Carmen also mentioned that. So can you do you have any advice for how we can maybe harness transdisciplinary research, um, yeah. specifically interdisciplinary, but then I guess involving marginalized communities in the research, as you mentioned? Yep. I have thoughts on both of those things. So I think historically, environmental economists have done a really good job of multidisciplinary research with pe- people in natural and physical sciences um, and not done a lot of work with people in other social sciences. And I'm working on a project right now with some social scientists. It's really interesting. And they have different methods and different paradigms. And I highly recommend it. Um, it's very valuable and I, I think mutually beneficial. Um, working with it with marginalized communities is tricky. Um, there's no trust, right? Um, Bonnie Keeler at the University of Minnesota gave one of the best talks I've ever heard about how you uh, you know do this and it's a long-term investment and you have to go people and you have to have you know something to give and something to share and it has to be all about them and not just I want to write this paper and I need to engage with you for it. <laughs> so uh, that's not something that we can do lightly. Um, it's something where institutions could build structures and build trust. Um, but it's something that I think other disciplines probably have more expertise in than we do, and we could learn from them. Yeah, that's a good point, because I think yeah. by the time a research grant is dried up, you pretty well have maybe that's that's the amount of time that it takes to build that trust often. And then yep. how do you build on that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That It has to be a long term thing. Yep. Yeah, great. Well, I see there's been a lot of questions we haven't been able to get to, uh, and a lot of people very thankful for your your talk. So I'd like to echo that. I think this was a great lecture. I think this is the perfect topic. It clearly got a lot of people thinking. It was probably one of the most relevant talks that we could come up with. So thanks again for taking time out of the evening and your busy, busy summer. Well, it was really my pleasure. I I enjoyed thinking about this, and and I've been reading all your comments, and I I really appreciate how engaged you all were. So go forth and solve the problems, right? We just we just gave you gave everybody some tricky things to think about and and looking forward to seeing what you all do with it. Great. Yeah. Thanks for asking all these difficult questions. <laughs> mm-hmm. Great. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Bye.